running a little behind this morning. We have a new employee at the factory. <laughs> We're getting really limited in the materials on hand that we have to make quality products. So we had to get really creative. It's not stuff I want to make in quantity, but definitely turn some heads in America. Yeah, we're having a fashion show. Today's been a bit frustrating for a couple reasons. First and foremost, power's out. But the problem is, this grinding is too much. Your father, 75 children. Ten wives. Ten wives, 75 children. I guess I don't, I don't know what else to say. What about in America? We do things a little different in America. Very good. <laughs> I think it'll hold its shape. So far it looks good. Ever seen a iron for leather? Pretty sweet. <laughs> Definitely the best one we've done so far. What is it that makes you the happiest? I know that sounds like a selfish question, but it's not intended to be. When are you at your best? Because when you're at your best, you can best help others. And that has so much to do with the reason why I'm here. I draw so much enjoyment from the lives I can impact here, but also in the way I can bring you into that process. Because I know you care so much, just like I do, about affecting lives here. And that is ultimately what drives me and sustains me. Because right here in this dusty, loud factory in Uganda is where I'm at my happiest and where I'm at my best. And I hope whatever it is for you, that you find it and you just go for it. that. <sighs> so my journey started here at APU, you know, but what I do now is in Uganda, just trying to make things happen. And I think what I want to talk about tonight isn't so much about what I'm doing in Uganda doing business, because I don't think everyone in here is going to go do business and do stuff in Africa or in Mexico or wherever. You all want to make a difference, but in your own way. And so part of my frustration, I think, as I've gone on my journey, is that everyone wants to share their story and what they do. But that's not relatable. And so what, why I wanted to show that was kind of give you some context on what it's like in Africa, and rather than just describe it, because how do you describe Africa? How do you describe what's doing business? And so I definitely could kind of start and share some stories about how we've been extorted by the local police, how our factory got flooded, you know, how we've had to shift our factory from Kenya to Uganda, and all these things. I mean, it is interesting work being out there, but it's not quite relatable. And so that's my story, but you know, if, if that's what I talk about, then you're gonna leave here saying, hey, that was a good story, but what does it mean to me? What about my own journey? And so, I mean, this topic is difference makers in business. And so that's how I'm trying to make a difference and pursue my own passions. But what about you guys? And so we all pursue it in our own way. And so a lot about what I want to talk about is really, well, what does that really mean? What does it mean to make a difference? And so I want to share my story um, and get into what I'm doing. But I think first and foremost, like what does it mean to have an impact? What does it mean to make a difference in business? And so the truth is, is that if I talk about just what I do and how I do it, well, I'm basically creating this idea that making an impact and pursuing a purpose means you gotta do something crazy, like go to Africa and start your own company. And not everyone is gonna do that. Not everyone should do that. I mean, LeBron James might be the best basketball player out there, but would he be the best lawyer? Would he be the best doctor? Probably not. And so we all need to find where it is that we're gonna be at our best. And so for me, that's going to Africa. And I think part of the reason, you know, I think Cindy brought me in was that it's important to kind of focus on people that do extreme things, not normal things. The same way we study Apple, we study Amazon, we, we study the outliers because it's easier to see what makes them who they are. And the same, 
you know, for me, having making a difference, making purpose, well, going to Africa is a bit different. And so it's important to talk about the things that have driven me to go do that, but only if it's in the context of, okay, well, what does that mean for you? And so, again, my frustration going to talks over the years, watching them out on YouTube, is just they talk about their own journey in isolation. And so, you know, everyone can have an impact in their life. Everyone can make a difference, whether you're doing the nine to five, whether you go do business in Africa or everything in between. But that's not how we approach this topic. You know, people in my industry, the social sector, however you want to talk about it, they talk about it as if impact is reserved for them. Making a difference is for them. And so because they want that recognition because they want a donation, they want you to buy their product. So they want the brand equity that goes along with them saying that they're doing great work. And if you're in Africa, like who's going to say you're not doing great work, you know, because these people are making sacrifices. They're probably making less money and it is great that they're out there. But if we really want to attack poverty, we really want to attack hunger and all these issues that we all care about, we need to frame it in a way that makes more sense. Because if I share stories about how poor people are and how it's crazy, just the things that they have to deal with, power going out, not being able to keep their kids in school, that's hard to relate to. I mean, we, we have guys in the factory who are just sleeping on a foam pad in the factory. Like a couple of them left their families in Kenya. Like that's just real life. And that's on a massive scale. But because it's on a massive scale, like what do we do with that? And so it's hard to really understand that. And so, I kind of want to unpack that a little bit and talk about what impact is because it's different for every person. And so, and again, you know, I've worked in the corporate world. I've worked in Uganda and now I'm starting my own company uh, in Africa. At every place, there's fantastic people who are doing great stuff. You know, I had a manager, uh, I worked management consulting for about five years. I went through some tough stuff and I had the best manager in the world who was there for me every step of the way. And everyone on my team just adored him, valued him so much, not just in the quality of his work, but in the relationships you know, with his employees, the people he managed. And so the truth is impact, making a difference is available to everyone. You know? And so, but again, in my industry, it's about reserving that for, for ourselves. And it shouldn't be that way. And so I think before really talking about my story, I think that's so important to establish that. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I talk with people a lot is, well, why are we having this discussion today? Were, were people going, um, talking about social impact, making a difference hundred years ago, 50 years ago? Probably not. Is that because us millennials are better? <laughs> no, we're all the same. We're all created by the same God. And so we all have the same capacity to care for others and act on it. What's different is that, you know, my grandparents, they grew up during, they were born in the Great Depression, grew up during World War II. I think it was pretty obvious what making a difference was. Defeat Nazi Germany, Japan, World War II. You know, my parents who grew up during the 60s, you know, with Vietnam War. I mean, my dad thought he might have been drafted. And there was civil rights, all that going on, and then the Cold War. I mean, America, we were trying to make it as a country. And so what's different with millennials is that the only world I know, the only world you know, is where the US, we're number one in terms of geopolitical power, economic stature. And so it makes sense that we want more than just going to school, getting a job. We want to make a difference. We want to push the envelope forward, but it's the same way every generation has gone about it. We all want to push it forward. Problem with, with us, you know, our generation is, well, what does that mean? It's not defined. We're not bad at going against Soviet Union, you know, in the Cold War, you know? And so that's why millennials kind of get a bad rap a lot of times because we want to push our generation forward, society forward, but what does it mean? Is it the environment? Is it global poverty, hunger, um, you know, saving the tuna fish out on the ocean, you know, you know we're, we're all scattered and want something. And so it's hard to really understand what it is we're trying to achieve and then be faced with the reality that most of us are going to be employees and jobs. And so we want purpose. We, we want impact. And then our managers just go, 
okay, well, here's our impact as a company. And so I think understanding how you make a difference, it comes about understanding yourself and what you need to be successful. For me, that's in Africa. But for you, it's probably not. And so, and I think we shouldn't have a judgment on what it is that you do. I mean, there, there should be, you know, understanding of, hey, you need to know yourself and know what makes you happy and know what makes you excel, you know, in your own life so that you can best help others. And so when, when organizations have slogans like this is impact, and then they have, you know, social impact reports and all this, they're presenting in a way where, again, impact is for them. It's for everyone. And so, but the key to unlocking that and kind of making a difference in, in this world is understanding how you're gonna make an impact in your own life, which comes down to knowing yourself, knowing what you need, and putting yourself in a place to be able to act upon it. And so for me, that's why I love APU so much, because I found that about myself. And so, so that's basically the foundation that I feel like doesn't get said. Because yes, I want to talk about the great things I'm doing you know, with my company, because at the end of the day, I need people to buy it. So I want people to think what I'm doing is awesome. I think that too, but I don't want to do it, but I don't feel right doing it in a way without that larger context and taking you out of the equation and making it all about me and what I'm doing and about the things I care about. Because the truth of the matter is, this business is that we all care but not all of us have ways to act on the things that we care about. That's why I'm doing a business. I need customers. This isn't so much about what I care about, it's what we all care about. And so, and so there, but there is no judgment there along with that on, hey, if you don't buy my product, you don't care enough. No, it's, I need to better communicate what I do. I need to make a better product. I need to better communicate what I'm doing in the community, or I just need to do things better in the community and create that, that value for you. In the same way, you know, if Apple comes out with a clunky phone, they need to make a better phone. They could try to market you and tell you, you know, how great they are, but at the end of the day, you're going you're gonna to use it, your friends are going to use it, and you're going to know, is it good enough or not? And so that's the same thing that I need to do and my peers in the sector need to do. But that's really not what happens. It's if you don't buy, if you don't give, you don't care enough. And, and I think that's part of the reason why these organizations stay small, these companies stay small, and these, these issues persist. So, so that's a bit of the background, you know, kind of on my journey and the things I've looked at in trying to start this company. And so, but again, it's not necessarily what I do, it's why I do it. And so for me, that's everything about my experience here at APU. You see, when, when I first came to APU, I had no idea what I wanted to do. You know, I, I joke sometimes with people that my major was soccer, my minor was girls, <laughs> which is kind of my way of saying I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was a poli-sci major because I've always been a little bit interested in history, but what do you, I didn't know what to do with history other than be a teacher. I didn't want to do that. And so I switched to business because I really I didn't want to do law or work in government. And so I thought business was a little bit more practical. But after a year in the business school, I said, well, I don't understand, you know, these concepts are vague in general. It, it wasn't really hitting home. But the reason it wasn't hitting home wasn't necessarily the classes weren't good, the professors weren't good. It, it was really about me. So do you guys still do StrengthsFinder at APU? Yeah. So StrengthsFinder is awesome. It's also terrible. <laughs> so the reason for it, it's awesome because it's very revealing and I think it helps guide you. The problem is, I had no context to view those strengths through. Like I didn't have enough life experience to know how I acted on those strengths and how they affected me. So for instance, my number one strength was belief. I'm like, well, I'm a Christian. I grew up in a Christian home. Sure, a lot of people have belief, you know, that's great. But it didn't come till years later that for me, I really need to believe in what I do for me to pu put my full effort into it. And so, I respect people who can, you know, like my manager I talked about um, at, at Booz Allen. He, he can wake up, do the nine to five, he has a family, he doesn't need anything more, he loves it. That's awesome. For me, just doing the nine to five, being in spreadsheets, it just doesn't, it, it's not enough for me. 
And so even though I did fine, I mean, if, if, I, if this venture fails, they, they would take me back. But my level of effort I could put into it, it's 50%, maybe even less than what I can do when I'm doing business in Africa. And so, but I, hadn't, I, I, hadn't, I didn't know that at all when I was at APU. And so ultimately, that's what I was trying to search for because other than soccer, other than girls, I did, there was nothing else I really cared about. And so I went to school basically to please my parents. You know, my, my brothers were 4.0 students. I was A's and B's, maybe a couple C's, but really just trying to make mom and dad happy because it was expected to do well in school because that's how you succeed in life, right? But, but again, after sophomore year, just, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not identifying with anything. And so that's where the shift came from trying to get that calling, that purpose to come to me versus going after it. And so when we talk about making a difference, I think you know, here it's, you know, what is your calling? What is your purpose? Which I never really liked those terms because calling, it, it sounds like God's going to open up the skies, the light's going to come down and, hey, do this. And that's not really how the world works. You know, at least it's not how it works for me. And so for me, I think now looking back, I like to frame in the terms of you know, finding your why. Um, you know, there, there's a TED Talk, Simon Sinek, you know, it was start with why. Don't tell me what you do, how you do it, but why. And that's kind of the reason why I talked about impact and what that means, because we need to lay that ground foundation. Like, don't just talk about what you do, but let's unpack why you do it. Because what I do is different than what you're going to do. And so that's what, and so why I think it, it's framed in a much better term when we ask why, because that's more looking at yourself. Calling to, to me sound like something was just going to come to you. But asking why says, okay, why do I do what I do? Why, what makes me happy? You know, and really trying to understand who I am, self-awareness. But that is such a tough thing to teach or, or pass on and learn from. And so... But, but I knew, you know, Einstein said, you know, if you continue to do the same thing, you're going to get the same result. Well, I needed to change something, which basically meant me, I need to go figure out what I like, what I want to do. So my dad would always say, sometimes it's important to know what you don't want to do. And that's great. That, that is important to know what you don't want to do. But that was pretty much everything. <laughs> and so I was like, well, when am I going to find out what I do want to do? So summer of sophomore year, um, after sophomore year, I was living here uh, in, in Azusa, actually at Crestview, which I think is University Village. Yeah, so I was working there, working at the FIDE establishment in San Dimas called Applebee's. Had a lot of time on my hands, which for me, I go a little bit stir crazy if I got too much. Especially since in college, that's when you have time. When you're older, time, it, it just gets eaten up. And so knowing that I didn't know what I want to do. I got junior year coming, and, and I just spent a semester at Citrus College because I couldn't afford to stay at APU. I, I was really just, I need to figure this out. And so what I ended up doing, and Cindy hit it on a little bit, is that I stopped in at Barnes & Noble, which was in the middle of basically here um, in San Dimas, where I was working. So, and again, as I said, school was not something I, I it was to please my parents. And I didn't read a single book I was supposed to in high school. My, my senior year, we read one book, Handmaid's Tale. And I, before the beginning of the year, said, OK, I'm going to read this book. I'm really going to try it to do it. Because I didn't like you know, showing up and just, oh, I didn't read, blow it off. Well, I read a couple chapters. And then I said, forget it. This is ridiculous. But the reason, the reason for that that I just that I said it wasn't because I didn't put in the time or whatever, but is because when I went to the class the next day after reading the chapter that I was supposed to, I did the exact same on the quiz that I would that I did when I wouldn't read at all. It, it, <laughs> yeah, you can identify exactly. And and the reason for, for me was I didn't care about what I was reading. So I wasn't retaining any of the information that because I just didn't care about reading this book. Like what why is it relevant to me? Why am I doing this? So going back to the belief, I just I couldn't force it. And so that's why it seems a little odd I went to Barnes Noble. But I think part of the reason is, well, I'm doing it on my time now. 
I can read anything I want. Because I know the value of reading, no, I know the value of learning, but just I need to find something I care about to actually spend my time doing it. So as I said, I've always been a little bit interested in history. And so I said, well, m let me go over to, I think it was current affairs or, or the history section in Barnes Noble. Let me see you know, if something strikes my interest. Well, I ended up centering on this book called Sudan. So 10 years ago, this, the genocide uh, in Darfur was going on. About this time, you know, it was kind of getting public attention. You had a lot of Save Darfur stickers. I think there was a march at Washington. Um, and some of my peers here at APU, you know, were talking about we got to do something, which, yeah, like that's terrible. And so, and so I picked up that book thinking, okay, well, I, you know, this is important. I, history, politics is kind of interesting to me, but it's also, okay, we want to do something about this. Well, what would we actually do if we did something? You know, because that, that's my personality and just trying to, you know, again, looking back now, this idea of we want to do something, but what would that be? Okay, I'm aware of this issue, but I don't want to be aware of issues. I actually want to do something once I'm aware. And, and so I said, okay, well, let's raise awareness, sure, but what would we actually do? I read the book, and it turns out it wasn't specifically about the genocide and what's going on in Darfur, but it was the whole history of Sudan, basically from independence to, to current day, which is you know 2007. And basically, again, not reading a single book in high school, I tore through that in probably two days. And so basically just seeing just how complex these issues are and just how so many factors are at play just fascinated me. And so, but it also said, well, shoot, we're not going to do anything about this genocide because short of invading the country and you know, turning to another Iraq, like what, there are no good options with civil war. And that's why it's just so difficult you know, to end it because it, it's difficult. I mean, this is people's, it's a sovereign country, you know, and there's so many complex issues at play. And so, and as we know, South Sudan broke off from Sudan. And that's part of the reason why we didn't really do anything. And now South Sudan is a disaster. I mean, it's a civil war in and of its own self. And so, and so I realized two things. One, I care so much about this. Like I finally found something I care about it. But what really drove it was that I knew everyone else cared too. But, but yet I was the one in there reading, really trying to dive in what the issue was. And so that was kind of started me on my journey is okay. I found something I care about. I found something I want to spend my time doing. And I think through the end result of that is that everyone else wants to be connected to this issue too. They want to, you know, affect it somehow. Now, again, it wasn't, wasn't civil war, but I said, okay, well, let me continue down this path. So I continue to read some on history, um, continue to read just some general politics. And then over time, I realized economic history kind of dictated a lot about how you know, economies go, countries go. And it really, the question that really started to drive at me was, well, why are poor countries poor, rich countries rich? You know, in a, in a very broad sense. And so that's what really fascinated me. And so more and more, I kind of shifted over to economics because that gave me a framework on how business, you know, happens and how countries operate. It just gave me a framework to look at the world that made sense to me. And so one of the books, you know, at, towards the end of this was Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell, who is a great writer, but talks about issues like rent control, um, I think minimum wage, and basically how these very simple seeming issues are anything but. And so again, just that whole idea of, you know, we want simple answers. We want, you know, shortcuts. We, you know, the world is often portrayed as something very simple, but it's just not. And that whole idea just kind of kept going. Um, with me. And so what happened is that at summer, I ended up reading 17 books entirely in Barnes and Noble. <laughs> I didn't have enough money to, to pay for these books. You know, books are expensive. And so, but also by going to Barnes and Noble, like I would, I'm in there, like, you know, I'm not leaving. And so it just, you know, I loved it. The manager, I think, got a little bit annoyed, but at the same time, it's just, hey, you're reading. And the the Barnes Noble and Gondora just opened up, so there wasn't a lot of, you know, weren't many people there, and it was just, I loved it. And so that's when, um, that junior year, they started the econ major here at APU, um, and that's how I got connected with Conover and ended up shifting to business economics, and 
um, really trying to focus on economic development. Um, but part of the problem was is that all we do in terms of international development and trying to help poor nations is charity. Well, I had been reading all, all these history books on countries growing and everything. There wasn't any charity in there. So I was kind of, well, what's going on here? You know, because charity, like, it's, it's, a good, it's a good thing. It can, it can help out, but that's only one tool that we have. So why is this whole industry, international development, you know, focused on just aid, charity, or focused on government policy? Because the truth is, during the Industrial Revolution, government was, was small. I mean, government had a role to play. Government's important. But that wasn't the story I was seeing in these books. On top of that, I started reading a lot about China. Because China is really the poverty reduction story of our time. I mean, the early 80s, I mean, the, poverty, the extreme poverty rate was, I think, 84% um, in 1798. Or, 1978 when they started doing a lot of the reforms. It's in the single digits now, and it's been in the single digits for the last you know, few years. Like, that's wild. But yet, again, I talked to, you know, look at what's going on in international development. No one knows anything about China. Because what I also realized is that we value political institutions over economic institutions. And the fact that China's communist politically we just don't want to give them any credit just because that goes against just kind of all our culture and what we know. Because again, this is sort of, you know, democracy, that's what everyone needs. I mean, democracy is great, but also there's a lot of bad democracies. And what I was seeing in China is people have never been more educated, you know, life expenses is going up, literacy is going up. We're seeing everything that we want to see. Yes, politically, they don't have a lot of freedom, but what, what's the point of freedom if you're in absolute poverty? And so it wasn't that, hey, we need more communist countries, we, we need more dictatorships, but it's more, let's just study what's, like, let's try to understand what's going on here because it seems completely different than what we're doing in Africa and what we're telling these countries that they should do. And so this, so as you see, this is like very like in the clouds trying to figure all this out. And so, again, I had this desire, but what do I do with it? Because basically I'm talking the status quo, it doesn't fit with the world, with what I'm seeing out there. And so this, these are some of the conversations I would have with Conover. Um, and so even though I wanted to go out there and kind of was thinking business ultimately is the way I need to go, but it's just, what do I, you know, what do I do? You start an international business, I have no connections, I don't have money. So I ended up going to grad school um, at UCSD. Basically, I need, there's a lot more I need to learn here. Um, and so UCSD was great, but it's funny. When I think of you know, Azusa Pacific versus UCSD, I mean, UCSD is a great school. I'm glad I went there. But it, does, it means a tenth to me what APU means. Because APU, I didn't just walk out with a degree. You know, I walked out with who I am. And so. You know, for me, when I, when I got to APU, me, me graduating, I think in my parents' eyes and most people's eyes, that's, that's success. But for me, graduating APU meant I didn't fail. <laughs> and for a lot of you who want more than just a degree and, you know, get a job, I mean, that's I mean you're not failing. Well, but we want to succeed. We, we want to do things. And so that's why APU means so much to me is because I, I understood who I was. But again, it became everything because I really dove into what drove me and what I cared about. And so, and, and that, I think that's the, the key there, just understanding who you are and what you need to kind of make you happy. And so we talk about di making a difference in the world that seems like we have to care about everyone else. True, like God designed us. We do care about people, you know, we're relational. And so when we're at our best, you know, when we're in a place that makes us happy, we can best help others. And so, Again, you know, kind of like the video said, chilled off, you know, what, where are you at your best? Again, it seems like a selfish thing to ask, but it's just how are you going to help others if, you, if you're not in a good place yourself? Um, and so, and that's why people, you know, will, can do it, get a job, do the nine to five or, you know, whatever it is, but there's still something that's missing. And, and I think I, I have plenty of friends who still don't really know what they're doing. They're push and pull, like, I don't know, maybe just having a job, providing my family, that's enough. You know? 
And, and the truth is, some, for many, like, that is enough. And that's awesome. You, you know, I mean, not everyone, you know, I was very lucky to grow up where I did. You know, suburban, San Diego, grew up a couple miles from the ocean. But it has nothing to do with me. Like, I won the birth lottery, you know, as some people say. And so, but that's all because of my parents, you know, and my grandparents, people who busted their butt to give me the life that I have. And so, but that doesn't mean, you know, and we talk a lot about privilege and what we can do with that. You know, it was the same thing here at Azusa when I was in school, but just in a different way. You know, we had a lot of people go on mission trips, travel abroad, and they say, oh my gosh, I have so much, let me give it all away. And so, and I get that, and maybe that is what you need to do, but I looked at it as, I've been given this opportunity, what am I gonna do with it? You see, I'm in this place to get a good education, and I can, I, I'm lucky enough that I can look at the world and say, it's not just about me, I wanna do more, I wanna you know, do more for others. And I think for a lot of us in here, I think that's probably where we're at too. It's not just about yourself in your place, you, you wanna help other people too. How do you do it? So, again, you know, for me, it's Africa. And so, and so what happened, I went to grad school, had this vague idea of a business, a business that wasn't focused on charity. Hey, we have a business, we donate a little bit. Because again, how is that really different than the status quo? Because again, we need new ideas. We need you know, things to be challenged. It's, it's not challenging to say, hey, we sell this product and then we donate to this organization. You know, because who's on the ground actually you know, doing new ideas? And so sure, it is innovative to kind of have a donation, have a company that gives back, that's good, but that's never gonna really get us to where we ultimately wanna go. And so you know, there's, there's a quote by Mother Teresa, if you can't feed 100, just feed one. That's great. Like it, but at the same time, if that's the only thing that we do, or what about the other 99? Because for me, that's, when I hear that quote, that's the only thing I think about, is I'm not okay with the other 99 being hungry. And so, but the truth is we need both. We need people who look at things and can do things right here and now, but we also need people who can step back and be, okay, but how do we really attack this issue? And so when I look at people, what's going on in Africa and the charity and, and all the organizations out there, I feel like if we can just help one, if I can just save one person, that's enough. For me, it's not though. And I think for a lot of us, it's not. We wanna shift the needle. You know, Uganda is a country, I think 30 million, 40 million people. You know, if we can help 100 people, you know, there's, what's the poverty rate? I don't know, there's 10, 15 million people living in extreme poverty in Uganda. You know, what's 15 million divide, you know, minus 100? 15 million. Like, what, what are we really doing there? And so, basically, I was still unpacking this after grad school. I got a job at Booz Allen Hamilton because basically I thought the idea, you know, what I needed to do was start my own company. So I got a job in management consulting in San Diego. Again, good job, but use all my vacation time at this point to travel down to Mexico. Um, try to network and figure out, okay, what is this business? What would I do? What's the product? Um, and so the basic idea of the business was a business that doesn't do charity, but invests the profit back in. So if you think of, you know, Apple right now is sitting on $250 billion in cash in the bank account. So what if Apple had to invest that money here, here in the States, or, you know, since they make a lot of money in other countries too, if they have to invest the money where they make the products before the shareholders get a dime. That's basically my model minus the 250 billion in the, in the bank account. <laughs> so the, the reason for that was it's really hard to invest in Africa. It's really hard to do business in Africa. That's why most people don't do business in Africa. <laughs> and so all these organizations, you know, they're doing important work. You know, the trend now is micro entrepreneurs. We got to help entrepreneurs. We do. But the most difficult thing is still actually doing business. And so, and two, 
the, the, the way things are is that we have big banks, financial institutions to f help out the big businesses. And then we have nonprofits, charity, microfinance to focus on people on the bottom end, end of the spectrum. For small, mid-sized businesses, there's no one there because the perception of the social return isn't there because you're not working with the poorest of the poor, but the financial returns aren't there because the cost of figuring out if it's a good opportunity for the bank financial institutions is the same. So there's a threshold. If you're lower than you know, basically $100,000, sometimes you know, 200, 300,000, it's just not worth the bank's time. And so again, going back to history and what I was seeing is that it's not the poorest of the poor that create businesses that create a ton of jobs. It's people who are still poor, but you know, have a little bit of education you know, and are doing okay. But that's not who we're supporting. That's not what we're doing. In China, for instance, it wasn't, again, it wasn't the people at the bottom of the spectrum. It was the people who were slightly more educated. And by slightly more educated, I mean maybe some high school education. That's about it. Now, they didn't have banks, financial institutions, but they were able to pool money from friends and family. I mean, just because a bank isn't there doesn't mean there aren't other ways you know, to start a business. I mean, Mark Cuban says only morons start businesses on loans. You know, I, I'm starting a business. I don't want to take on a loan. I don't want to have a responsibility to that. You know, if I raise money, I want to raise money in a position of strength. And right now, I'm trying to get myself in that position with my own money. You know, and so you only want to raise money at, as a last resort. I mean, if you raise money, if you get equity investors, you're selling part of your business. But also, if you get a loan, like, you got debt. And so there, and, but those are only f formal ways that we get finance. And that's typically all we talk about. But there's so many other ways. And the most typical way is, is informal, you know, friends and family. You know, that's true today. You know, that's true in other countries. That's historically how things have happened. But again, that's not what we focus on and what we do. And so that was why, OK, if I have a business, we invest all the money, all the profit. But, you know, I, can I cover my costs so I can you know, feed myself. But for me to actually profit from it, I have to put it back into the local economy. So that's why it's a, you know, so this bag, we only have a couple sample items, but I said leather bags. This is uh, what we're trying to do with the drawstring bag, but trying to make a other couple of shopping bags, tote bags. But it's a consumer product company that then funds a financial vehicle that then invests the profit into small, mid-sized businesses. I'm going to lose money investing. Like, I, I, I know that right away. 